All right, welcome everyone. Thanks everybody for coming. My name is Rob Daly. I'm a, a systems engineer for SwiftStack. I'm going to be talking to you about optimizing hardware for OpenStack Swift. This is my coworker, Eric. Eric? Hi, I'm Eric uh, Jolson. Uh, also works for SwiftStack, a systems engineer. Great. So we're going to talk to you a little bit today about um, about the overview of Swift. Kind of make sure that we kind of set the table uh, so that. You know, I'm sure there are people in the room here that are, um, you know, that know a lot about Swift. There's some other people here that, that may not be as familiar with it. So we want to take a couple minutes just to make sure we set the, uh, the, the groundwork for that. Uh, then we want to go into what are, what are some of the choices, right? What's the decision tree for making choices about, uh, about the hardware that you choose for Swift? Then we're going to go in. Eric's going to talk to you about uh, a couple of reference architectures that we've used kind of as building blocks. Uh, for, for some of the deployments we've done for, through our company for SwiftStack. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about optimizing the builds. What are some of the things that you need to look out for? What are some of the things that you want to, um, you want to be uh, aware of when you're making those choices? We'll talk a little bit about benchmarking. And then, of course, at the end, I've got to plug SwiftStack a little bit. I'm going to talk about SwiftStack and tell you guys what, what it is we do for Swift and, and how we make it easier to, uh, to deploy and manage. All right, and we'll follow that up with some Q&A at the end if we have some time, and we should. So Swift overview. So, so why Swift, right? Why Swift object storage? So um, codename Swift. This is the object storage platform for OpenStack. And the, the key point here is that it's software. I think a lot of people out here have kind of heard the term software-defined uh, storage kind of ad nauseum, right? But uh, we, we do get put in that category sometimes. Uh, Swift uh, was designed really for unstructured data, and uh, they threw away the assumptions of file and block solutions that um, are, are made for, for certain points, right? File and block have been out there for 20, 30 years, some of them, right? Some of these POSIX type file systems that are out there. And to be able to make that scale to petabytes and maybe millions, and, and some of our customers have billions of objects. That, that's not so easy using those traditional methods, right? So object storage was created to kind of throw those assumptions away and rethink the way that we do, uh, that we do things. I think collective we can, we can agree that uh, scale out has, has really won over uh, the scale up type of architecture. In some cases, that might not be the case. But generally speaking, the Googles of the world and the, the Facebooks of the world have, have really figured out that scale out is really the model to go, and Swift is, is definitely following in those footsteps and, and blazing a trail for, uh, for object. So how is Swift used? And I'm gonna, this is like a crash course in Swift, but I want to make sure people understand it. So Swift is an HTTP API. This is, like I said, it's not a file, mountable file system. It's not a, a LUN that you, uh, that you create. It's an HTTP API, but don't get caught up in that thinking that you need to be a programmer to be able to access it. There's a lot of different um, tools out there, clients, applications, uh, backup tools. Uh, in fact, SwiftStack has our own web client that you can use uh, to be able to uh, do drag and drop right in your browser into that API. So that's the format that you're looking at up there. The, the format of, of a typical object uh, is in the form of a URL. And you have three really important pieces here is, is the accounts, the containers, and then your objects themselves. Think of your account as like your namespace within your Swift cluster. Within that, you own containers. Think of containers as the traditional sense as directories or in like Amazon terminology like buckets. Really, those are just collections of your objects. So that, that URL is, is important to remember. That's, that's really how uh, the determination and placement of objects uh, throughout the system, where they land and how they get placed. I'll talk about that. I talked about unstructured data. What's great about Swift is that there's zero uh, single points of failure. Everything is designed in, in order for it to be a massively scalable system, but entirely redundant at all times. Eventually consistent, that's a really important concept for Swift. Eventually consistent means, in traditional terms, that's like saying, well, I have asynchronous replication, right, in, in the traditional sense. Eventual consistency means if I place an object into uh, the system into the Swift cluster. What that means is Swift wants to take that object and it wants to create three replicas of it. That's the default, and you can change that if you need to. But if I want to take those three replicas, what Swift wants to do is place them in the most unique pl 
places as it possibly can. Now those most unique places might be three disks inside of one chassis, inside of one server. Or that might be uh, a server down here in Atlanta, and that might be a server up in New York, and maybe one out in LA. You design the Swift architecture based on what your failure domains are, and Swift is able to route failures around that. So, you know, jokingly we say sometimes we welcome failure, we welcome uh, disks that fail because Swift is able to withstand those types of things. So what are the most common use cases for Swift? So the reason I wanted to bring this up is, is of course you can guess what a lot of them are, but the reason I want to bring it up is just to get you kind of thinking about the use cases because that's always going to drive a lot of the hardware decisions that we make, or at least be a major, a major factor. So image data, log files, video rendering, right? Anything that, again, is generally um, uh, non-structured type data that you, you need to scale almost infinitely at times, all right? And now, the reason that I bring this up, again, is these are gonna help you make decisions on the hardware choices that you make. Eric and I are gonna make some, some, we're gonna show you some rules of thumb, some reference architectures on how you make choices about the hardware that you're gonna use, but this is definitely gonna come into place, right? What, what use cases that you have. So we'll talk a little bit about the architecture tiers for Swift. So I hope everybody's good. That was, that was the quick crash course in, in how Swift is working. So the Swift architecture tiers allow you to break out a bunch of the functions within Swift, okay? So Swift has the concept of a proxy layer, and proxy is just, think of that as a, a piece of software, right? A piece of software in the data path as we're accepting new objects into the cluster. And that proxy is really the one that's representative or, or responsible for spreading the data around the cluster and the available uh, uh, capacity that I have. So that, that proxy software also, it, that's just one layer. We also have an accounts layer, which is representative and, and responsible for that account namespace that I talked about earlier. The container uh, service, that's also another uh, service tracking uh, piece of software and then the object service themselves. So those four services, the beauty of the, the tiering is they can all sit on one box like we have right here, right? We call that PACO. One of the guys here in the front row coined that term. PACO would be proxy account container and object acronym. And what PACO means is that I can place all those services in one. In fact, some of our smaller architectures that we'll be talking about is um, they start with the PACO idea. The beauty again is that I can start with PACO have all those services on one node, but over time, if I want to break that out into another set of tiers, what I can do is I can break those proxy nodes away from my accounts, containers, and object services. Why would I want to do that? One reason is, you know, think, think maybe like the, um, I don't know, maybe like the Hadoop uh, example, where I can now disaggregate the compute side from my storage side. Proxies are gonna be handling a lot of requests, right? They're gonna be handling a lot of the API calls for the data that I'm putting in and the data that I'm pulling out of my cluster. So that's gonna be more compute intensive, right? That's, that's gonna be doing a lot more network shuffling and it's, it's gonna be handling, in, in some cases, SSL termination. So you're gonna need a little bit more horsepower on the CPU side. But now I don't need to have a direct ratio of proxy to object. Maybe I have a lot more proxy servers than I have object servers. So that's where we start talking about the next, the next possible tier. And this is probably more of a medium to large, probably the most common use case that, that we see. Placing the proxy servers and the accounts and containers, accounts and container services really want solid state drives, okay? The accounts and containers are really metadata about the objects, not the objects metadata. That's, that's kind of a point to, to make clear. It's, it's metadata about the objects, right? Who, who owns them, who, uh, how many are there, how many objects, how much capacity is in each container. All that information is stored in the accounts and container services. For, for that type of metadata, I need quick access to it. And that's, that's a very big change from the file system structures that we're used to, right? File system structures, in, in most cases at least, make it a bit difficult for you to break out that metadata from the actual files or the objects themselves. 
right? This allows me to tier that as well. I can tier out the proxies. I can tier out the accounts and containers and the objects. I can set them as, as three completely separate tiers. These are for massively scalable architectures, okay? So we'll talk a little bit about some of the hardware choices that are out there. So there, there's always a decision tree, right? What, what's number one in everybody's heart, right? Price. I got to get the lowest cost for the amount of terabytes that, that I need to deploy uh, in, in, my, in my cluster, and, and you know, I need to squeeze every penny out of this thing. Price, of course, is, is always big. So we have architectures from some of the, the name brand customers. We also have a lot of customers that use white box approaches, right? Again, the beauty of Swift is that I've got I've got the ability to withstand failure, so maybe I can also withstand you know, using less reliable hardware, not to say one vendor is better than the other. But that, that's part of the, the consideration that this architecture allows me to make. The reliability, this is more, to me at least, uh, reliability is more of a function of what the Swift software does. How many replicas, right? How many, how many times do I want to store those objects? How much redundancy do I want to build into the system? How many locations am I going to place this? Is all this data going to be in one data center, or am I going to have it replicated out amongst three, four, five, six different data centers, right? Swift's, Swift's going to allow you to do that, OK? Performance, that's, that's a key metric, I'm sure, for everyone, right? How large is it going to be? What are the networking implications of my performance? And what is the load balancing services that I have? And then finally, scale. Right? This is a tough one because, you know, me and Eric, when we interface with customers, I know a lot of times we'll say, you know, how large is this deployment going to be in 12 months from now? What's it going to look like in 24 months? And most of the time, and I'd be in the same spot, people shrug their shoulders and say, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm growing at a rapid rate, and I need to solve this problem. So scale is, is at the very bottom of this list uh, for, for a good reason. So we have some example architectures. I'm going to let Eric uh, talk about these a little bit. These are some of the reference architectures he helped build, and, and he's going to describe them to you. So um, not to add what uh, Rob was talking about, right? but uh, there's considerations for when you, when you decide how to start out your cluster, uh, do, you wanna, do you think you're going to have a cap on your, on your data? Are you going to look today what you look in a year? That's going to change all this. Uh, but I tried to find something in the middle. Um, to talk about today. So uh, first of all, my first advice is uh, don't overdo it. Don't, don't overdo your architecture of the hardware today. Because as, as you get your production data on the system, you get production traffic on the system, it will all change. And that's where another great aspect of Swift, you change your architecture as your data patterns change, as your volume change. That's like we saw how, how you break out your tiers, start in a combined node, a Paco, break out your proxies. If you don't have enough throughput, maybe you add more proxies. So um, put together a matrix. I think you can actually see it. It's big enough up there. Um, the first line, uh, testing, very important. Create a test cluster. Try to get as close to production data on it. Point some applications to it. This will help you create a closer to, to, to good architecture later. So what's important in a testing cluster? Uh, maybe you only have the ability to have one node. If you have only one node, make sure you have enough hard drives in it to be able to simulate failure to understand how the software works. Uh, this is your chance. If you rip a couple of hard drives out, what should you expect from the software? What will, what will happen? Uh, how will your applications deal with, with the workarounds of Swift? Uh, I would recommend always have three nodes. Uh, turn a node off. What happens? Delete the node out of your cluster. Now what happens? This is, this is a great learning experience, both from the developers consuming the service and from the operators running your Swift cluster. So uh, the next step. Uh, small deployments. Uh, I consider these in the range, maybe 100, 200 terabytes of usable storage. Um, recommendation for most, most everybody, uh, Paco nodes will take you far. Uh, you don't need to break out proxies unless you're in an extreme edge case of, of performance or uh, 
Yes. Um, we have the archive use case coming down the middle in the matrix. Um, I consider that as uh, write once, read maybe. If this is truly just an online, just a storage for something you might need, uh, maybe you, you would architect a little different. Uh, medium deployments, uh, the big line in the middle. Uh, maybe petabyte, maybe just below a petabyte, maybe two, three petabytes usable space. Uh, it's time, uh, start, break out the proxies. Uh, it makes it easier to grow your cluster over time. You can add a proxy capacity versus storage capacity separately. Um, also at this scale, start thinking of, you're not gonna add a node at a time. Maybe you add a, a rack at a time, maybe you add a, a group of nodes at a time. But have that conversation with yourself and, and your department to to know where you're heading, it'll, it'll save you headaches down the road. So at, at these scales, we also see archive use cases more. So the difference here, uh, less proxies. Right? An archive use case, you might stream data slowly into a, a large cluster and never really read it again, uh, but you need it there just in case. Save on the proxy tier. You don't need, you don't need to quick access or quick, quick writes into your cluster. Uh, you can also go much deeper on the nodes. So here's where we see nodes with 60, 80, 90 hard drives per, per compute node. So very, very big nodes. Um, and then over on the right is something we're seeing lately. It's coming up more and more. How do I do high performance? How do I get a CDN out of Swift? So uh, smaller nodes, uh, fewer drives per node, faster networking. Uh, and sometimes here, break it out to your three tiers. So break out separate servers with account container data, uh, separate from the object nodes. Um, the last line I put up there, because uh, what happens if you get to a point where someone says, I need 20 petabytes and I'm growing to 100 within the next 18 months? Uh, I, I can't give advice for what that'll look like, because it, at these scales, it's gonna be very, very important to understand what the throughputs are, what the use cases are, what types of data, how it's gonna be accessed. So we start talking about custom builds and it can save you a lot of money uh, uh, by really, really, maybe here is where you overdo it, right? Um, let's see, so I put together a small, small 100 terabyte usable. Um, I wanna say if this is truly a production deployment, Consider, if your budget afford it, uh, nine nodes. You can have three zones, you have three nodes per zone. It'll, it'll save you when you have a node failure in the future, because you will. Um, it'll be easier to recover by spreading. Your, your blast radius for losing a node uh, becomes smaller the more nodes you have. So in this case, uh, Paco nodes again. You can get away, unless you have a very high performance you're on the high performance spectrum, single CPU, 64 gigs of RAM, 12 hard drives in a 2U node. Uh, once again, one gig networking. Most servers comes with four, four NICs. Bond them, do some creative VLANing. Uh, you get good enough throughput. Um, as you're looking at something bigger or you're looking to grow, um, kind of a medium deployment, 650 terabyte usable. Uh, scales linearly sideways, so uh, if you need a petabyte, add a rack. Um, like I said before, break out some proxy nodes. Um, here I place six proxy nodes across the cluster, two per rack. Uh, notice how the CPUs in the proxy nodes are much, much faster CPUs here. They're, they're, Two of them, and they're actually, I think this model is an eight, eight core, two and a half gigahertz. Uh, still RAM, 64 gigs, uh, two hard drives. It's really just for the OS. No data goes across those. Uh, and also 10, 10 gig networking. As your cluster grows, the backend networking uh, needs to grow with it. Uh, and also just to make the number uh, 650 terabyte usable, uh, 15 nodes, 36 drives each, uh, gives you a good, you lose a node, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. 
the 15th of your cluster. Uh, keep that in mind. So uh, if you have a node failure, you need to have s spare capacity in your cluster. Uh, don't, don't ever fill your cluster 100%. Uh, I, think, I think that's all I had. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Yep. So let, let's talk a little bit about optimizing those builds, right, and, and taking some of the, the principles that, that Eric just showed us. So I'm going to break this out and, and assume a, this is generally what we see the most is, is really a two-tier, a three-tier uh, setup, not necessarily the, um, the Paco that we've been talking about. Paco generally is, is for smaller deployments. This is going to be for larger. So I'm going to start with the proxy. And this, this is uh, We've been talking all this time about not using RAID or relying on Swift to give us that level of redundancy uh, for each individual drive that is sitting in, in the system. The only place that you may want to, you may want to use RAID is on your operating system. And we actually have customers that, um, and, and deployments, where they've chosen to just go with one disk on their proxy or one disk for their operating system for um, for their object server. And, and the reason being is when you start to scale to hundreds, if not thousands, of, of nodes, the loss of one of them is one thousandth of a percent of your entire cluster. Maybe it's not worth buying a second hard disk, uh, hard drive for the operating system times a thousand of those systems when you think about the cost of it. So if you're able to withstand the outage of one, and since everyone is in, treated as an equal citizen within Swift, be it the proxy layer or any of the other layers, everyone's an equal citizen. Um, you, may not, you may not need that level of redundancy. Start with a minimum of two proxies. I think that kind of goes without saying, right? Uh, we, we go through all this trouble for no single points of failure. The proxy is, uh, is at least a minimum of two. You're probably even going to want to do more than that. And again, you can add these um, kind of ad hoc when, when, you need, uh, when you need more bandwidth or you need more, um, more processing power up front. More CPU power, that goes without saying, right? We want more CPU uh, power within uh, our proxy nodes, and we'll give you a little bit of, of math on that. Uh, so the next, the next point, I uh, just wanted to say that the proxy nodes themselves are not really doing any disk I/O, right? What they're doing is they're really shuffling all the data that's coming in through the HTTP API requests, and they're taking that data and then they're spreading it down to the available storage behind it. So there's, there's really no disk I/O. It's not a, a, something that you need to take into consideration. This is kind of, again, rule of thumb. And this, this doesn't have to be an exact science. And I see all the cameras going up for it. Um, this is kind of a rule of thumb for us in how we figure out you know, how much CPU we need based on the amount of storage. And again, your use case, your use case may vary, right? Um, but to, to use a couple of examples, we can figure out how much CPU power we need on the proxy side based on the disks that we have on the back end. And you'll see some of this in a lot greater depth. I'll give a quick plug to the book that our team wrote uh, that is available at our, at our booth uh, on Swift. And you'll see a lot of these principles in there in a lot greater depth. But to kind of summarize how we would do some of the math, take, take a one to two CPU, proxy, uh, CPU power to, to drive count. When we're talking about a low concurrency, maybe a few hundred uh, concurrent uh, connections into the system, kind of come up with the math to figure out what the, the overall processing power is that I have on my proxies, and then uh, apply that to how many disks on the back end. And we'll show you the, uh, an example that, uh, that reflects that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then the, the second example is, is a high concurrency one. Um, just, just a lot more CPU power for a lot more, a lot more throughput and a lot more requests that we can handle. So the accounts, containers, and objects, I'm going to just make a, a general assumption here that those are held together. Those services are going to be held together on one, one physical box. Again, we don't need any RAID. We're going to take care of that. Swift, the software, is going to take care of that. Um, so don't worry about putting RAID in for your account container uh, SSDs. We want SSDs. Uh, we want low latency response times uh, for when we're doing those lookups and we're making metadata changes uh, as we upload thousands and hundreds of thousands of objects into the system. That metadata needs to reflect that. This is a, a general rule of thumb, and I've gotten some feedback from some people internally. This may or may not be right, but I'm, I'm going to go with it. So, uh, from a general standpoint, to be able to size how much uh, storage you're going to need for those, uh, for those services, for the accounts and container databases, um, it's about 1% to 2% of your overall used data uh, objects within your cluster. And, and again, that could vary, but it's a rule of thumb that, that we like to follow. 
in other words, sizing from a capacity standpoint is not going to be a huge deal with the SSDs that you're going to be using. It's, it's going to be a relatively small amount of, of storage. So coming up with the, the RAM on the object nodes, and, and this one we should put like a big asterisk on it, uh, because really the rule is the more RAM the better, right? The more RAM that I have, the better uh, performance that I'm going to see on the back end. But obviously, uh, when we start scaling this out, RAM is going to be one of the uh, cost factors that's, that's going to help change that decision a little bit. So the very minimum, the very minimum that we'd like to see is a gigabyte of RAM per hard drive. Now, some of our customers go a further route, and if they're using a four terabyte drive, they actually go one gigabyte of RAM per terabyte of storage that they have in the system. So this is the minimum. That would probably be more of a maximum, um, not that there's any, any limit. Really, the reason that we want to do this is at the very lowest level, every disk drive in the system is formatted as the XFS file system. And XFS is going to leverage RAM for all of its inode lookups uh, within, within each one of those disk drives. So the more of that that I can cache up front, the better the performance and the lookups are going to be when I go to retrieve a, an object randomly from, from somewhere within the cluster. Then the object node disks themselves. So this is going to be dated pretty, pretty soon, right? Um, I'm, I'm talking about three and four terabyte uh, SATA drives. The six terabyte drives are, are already out there, and, and we're starting to see them. We're doing some testing with them internally, uh, some of these helium drives. But the, the key thing to take away here, and, and sh I should have bolded it, is we want to use SATA drives, right, or maybe even enterprise SATA drives. And, and again, I, I keep harping on the point, we want to make sure that we don't overpay for fiber channel drives or, or SAS-based drives, and there's really no need for them. Throw out the conceptions that you have of you know, rebuild times, of RAID sets. That, that goes away. If we lose a disk in a Swift cluster, there's no such thing as a rebuild. What the cluster is going to do is it's going to rebalance the data that it has on the existing capacity that it has. And when you get to finally you know, go grab that new four terabyte drive to replace it, Swift is going to say, oh, OK, I got that capacity back. I'll rebalance on top of that. So the point is, we don't need like these ultra fast, low latent drives to store your objects because really Swift, Swift kind of works in a much different, uh, different fashion than, uh, than traditional RAID sets. So don't think about rebuild times anymore. That's a thing of the past. I, I should actually, there you go, I messed up. Just to give you a little bit of the, um, the math at the end, um, I think most people have got pictures of it, but just so that I, I touch on it, the desired capacity that you have within your cluster, um, just to figure out what some of the, uh, the actual raw numbers are going to be um, when you convert base 2 and base 10 numbers, what the, what the numbers are going to be, the, the size of the drives, and how many bays are going to be in your chassis. Um, and as Eric was talking about, underfill those, those chassis when you first start. And the reason that I'm saying that is don't populate a 36-bay uh, chassis, and now your next step to grow is to have to go and buy a whole other 36-bay chassis and fill that whole sucker up, right? It might be a little bit easier to underfill it, but you know, scale out a little bit wider and leave five to 10 of those, of those slots open just at the very beginning, as you're beginning to learn what your cluster does, what the performance characteristics are going to be, and you know, operationally, what's it going to be like to have to add in uh, capacity into that, into that cluster? Networking. Networking is a huge piece of, uh, of Swift. Um, there, are three, there are three different network interfaces that Swift uses. The outward facing one is, is quite obviously the one that's handling all the requests that come inbound. We always recommend that you use 10 gigabit uh, in almost every iteration uh, of, of our deployments. And those requests are, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, I thought I heard a question. Those requests are actually going to come from a load balancing solution, and, and that's the next slide that I'll talk about. The cluster facing interface is the second one. That's actually going to be the one that takes that data that already came in and disperses it out amongst the storage. So when you think about it, if I have a write request that comes in for a one gigabyte file and a one gigabyte object, that object is going to get come in at one gig, but it needs to stream out at three gig, right? So think of your cluster facing interface as in, you know, in all intents and purposes, needs to be 3x the capacity of what your, your uh, outward-facing interface is going to be. And if you have four replicas, the same principle would, would apply. It's now going to need to be 4x and et cetera. 
Traffic is not encrypted, and that's, that's something to take into account, okay? Um, I've worked with some customers that that's, that's a necessity. That's something that out of band, we need to come with uh, some, some encryption strategies for how we do that. And the same applies for the replication network, which is the third and final network. Uh, the reason that we have all these networks really is for flexibility, right? It gives us different choices for how we want to architect Swift. The replication network uh, is almost an, an automatic when you have multi-site, in other words, multiple region clusters, right? Clusters that are in, in different geographies, all right? This, this is going to be leveraged. Since I already explained to you how data comes in and then is dispersed out, the replication network is really going to be used when there are changes made to my, my cluster, right? So if I lost capacity, if I added in new capacity, maybe I added in a whole new uh, data center. That's where the replication network gets used. So sometimes, at least starting out, what our customers will do is these don't need to be dedicated interfaces. They can bond them together, right? I could bond together two or three or four 10 gig interfaces, maybe just for redundancy purposes, but also just to put you know, VIPs on those that each one of these services can leverage. All right, so the point is they don't need to be dedicated. And then we'll, we'll talk about load balancing and uh, make sure I'm, I'm cognizant of time here. So the load balancing service is something that's really uh, handled out of band from Swift. So this is uh, really another service that we have um, that we leverage from a software perspective or a hardware perspective. So we can do SSL termination at the load balancing level, or we can do SSL termination down at the proxy level. It's gonna depend on where you want that, that kind of extra workload, that extra weight uh, to be handled. Do you want it load balanced or do you want it uh, down at each proxy? It's, it's all dependent. What are some of the hardware choices? The, these are just a, a list of them. I'm not picking favorites by any means. These are just some that we see out there. And there are some software-based ones as well. Um, I know we use HA Proxy in a couple of, of instances. LVS, Linux Virtual Server, that's actually something SwiftStack packages with, um, with our, our offering as, as a load balancing service. It's for, for smaller sized uh, implementations, the VRRP based uh, protocol, um, and then some people don't even use those. Maybe they'll use round robin DNS for kind of uh, handling the, the inbound requests that are, get spread out to the proxies. So coming to a, a close here, I want to make sure that we at least touch on benchmarking a little bit. So um, there are a couple of different tools out there, and again, I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to be picking favorites by any means, but um, these, these are some that we see pretty regularly. Um, SS Bench is something that was uh, designed by Swift Stack and is maintained in the community. Uh, Swift Bench is another very popular one, and Cosbench as well. Um, I, I generally send, tend to see SS Bench more often than not, so that's what I'm going to kind of show you an, an example of, um, at least some summation of what some of that data looks like. So this is from a, an existing customer that, that one of my uh, coworkers did uh, some of the work on here. So this is just you know test cluster um, to be able to see kind of what the, the characteristics would be of puts and gets, right? What the, uh, the writes and the reads would look like. So three nodes, you'll actually see up here, these are actually the, uh, the benchmarking servers themselves. And then we've got the uh, nine, nine nodes and three proxies uh, each. All right, so uh, there's, a, um, there's a typo here. There should be, those should be filled in all the way, so I apologize. But you can kind of see the, the output that you get here is, generally speaking, if I've got, if I'm doing get requests, all right, I'm doing a bunch of reads, and across that hardware that I, that I chose to use, I'm generally going to be bound from a CPU perspective, right? This is not, this is not a lot of uh, bandwidth. This is a lot of, of requests coming in and out of the system. So the way that this works is I've got 50 workers that the system set up. Uh, we set it at, at 10,000 user concurrencies. How fast can I read, can I get 800,000 requests, right? And what it wound up being is at about 16,000 random 1K requests per second against those 315 drives. And again, those are random, so keep, keep that in mind. And you can see as you kind of go down, and the objects get larger as I'm placing them in, right? I, I no longer become bound at, this, at the CPU layer. I'm really, and to be honest with you, this is probably not the greatest example, but I'm really bound network-wise up here because the two nodes that I showed you earlier, they're actually the benchmark, the, the workers. 
those are actually the ones that are bandwidth constrained because they can't push enough data out to the 315 uh, uh, disks quickly enough. But you can see that it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a scale and a balance. Is it the proxy tier that I might, I need to bo uh, boost a little bit and beef up? Or is it the object side of things that I need to, to boost up? Beyond the, the get requests, also have some, some put requests against the same, the same thing. One thing to take into account here, this is really representative of what is the user seeing, right? This is, this is user uh, information. So the user sees 6,000 some odd requests a second. But we know as administrators on the back end that we multiply that times three, right? Because we have three replicas happening. So it's, it's really, when you think about it, the reads and the writes are, are relatively close to, to one another um, in, in terms of performance because that, that number would generally be about, uh, about the same as the read requests were. So I got, I got a couple minutes left here. I just want to real quickly talk about uh, SwiftStack and, and what our company does and some of the software that, that we've created. So SwiftStack has created uh, a web-based management infrastructure that helps manage your Swift deployments from, from really from cradle to grave, right? You can, you can deploy within minutes a Swift Stack Swift deployment. You can also manage it from the cloud. We have a couple of different options for how you can manage that. You can manage your entire storage infrastructure from the cloud, and how do you do that? Our infrastructure is entirely out of band. Our management piece is out of band, meaning no data actually comes through it. It's solely for the purpose of managing your, your information, right? The Swift nodes themselves that are on your premise, that are local to your business, that's where the data flows in and out of. We can't see that data, we can't pull that data. All we're getting is metadata about that. We open a open VPN tunnel between our controller, we call it the controller, and your nodes so that we can manage things like what are performance expectations, what are capacity fill rates, Hey, are there alerts? Is, did something go down? Did I lose a disk? Did something, something go wrong with the cluster that I need to rebalance uh, the existing capacity? So all these things that, um, again, are outlined in, in the book, and I'll show you the book here. You can go get a copy of the book. Hopefully, we have some left. You can get a copy of the book over at, the, um, at our booth. But a lot of this is detailed in, uh, in great detail. It's put in great detail uh, for how to scale these things out if you were just building your own Swift cluster without Swift Stack, then we show you, okay, after these couple hundred pages that you've read and the difficulties you can imagine trying to put this in operationally, how much easier this is uh, with a management portal, with people that have been doing this for three, four, five years uh, that have really perfected how to manage uh, this infrastructure. Last plug, because I know my marketing manager's over here and I want to get it right. So we've got a, we've got a party tomorrow night, guys, at uh, 8.30 at the Tabernacle. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, we're all going to be there. Come talk Swift to us. Come ask me questions. Ask Eric questions. Um, we're happy to, uh, to engage with you. And that's it. We have a couple minutes left. I know I ran kind of late, but are there any questions that I can answer for anybody? Yep. Sure. So you're asked, so the question is how many, what, what's kind of the breaking point for when I want to use SSDs for accounts containers? I'm going to give a rule of thumb, and, and hopefully I don't, I don't botch this up, but I, I think the rule of thumb is um, generally about a million containers within an account and then a million accounts. Um, that's generally kind of the, the, the breaking point that we like to give. The object number is, is less, of a, um, less of a hard number that I can give because it's going to vary based on, on what your object size is. Maybe we could talk a little bit more about that. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll get, get you there. Yeah. That's actually that's a, a great question. So no promises here, but one of the things that we've been engaged with that, that we're kind of taking seriously is um, we've been asked about InfiniBand connectivity. And the architecture is such that you could place 
uh, an InfiniBand, um, an InfiniBand infrastructure in band with this type of architecture, right? I can, I can use Swift with something like that, as well as 40 gig infrastructure. The, the point is, anything that Linux, Ubuntu, Red Hat, and uh, CentOS are gonna support, we're gonna be able to support, because Swift lays on top of that as a software layer, which is, that, that's the beauty of the system. I, I know you had a question. I think we got time for one last question. Um, so I want to make sure that I got it right. Um, the ratio between metadata information to object data. Yeah. Metadata, I mean account and uh, account information and, and um, container information is one to two percent. Generally speaking, that's the capacity that it's going to take on those SSDs. So if I've got a you know a petabyte of object storage, then I'm going to have you know roughly a, a terabyte, maybe two terabyte of SSD capacity need that I'm gonna have. But remember, that's gonna be spread across a whole bunch of nodes. Yep. All right. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Thank you.